the real watch list plus we're doing the amazing film night of the living dead 1968 george romero low budget which turned into a blockbuster and probably one of the greatest drive-in movies anybody ever saw A ragtag bunch of Pennsylvanians barricade themselves in an old farmhouse to ward off a horde of flesh-eating zombies that are ravaging the countryside. And it all starts with Barbara and her brother Johnny visiting her, their father's grave when out of the blue, they're attacked by a strange man. Barbara runs to the shelter of what seems like an old abandoned farmhouse. And this is the Criterion Collection of Janus Films, which take films in their collections because they're so significant to the American culture. Turn it. Ooh. Number 10. ten. And you give a 10 with ten. a heart. A heart. Well, that's a brain. Oh. It has such great long establishing sequences where mm -hmm. the car in the beginning drives into the cemetery and you watch it come up the long and winding road and it settles you down to not know what's going to happen. When the man is wandering around, you have no idea. Right. And it's just done so I don't know so if he's cleverly. a groundskeeper or and, just you know, someone paying respect to someone. Yeah, and the zombies that are zombies in it, they're so realistically horrible, each individual one, that it was so... Unique, instead of just people going, Ugh, they actually had a naked one. They had people in their 90s. They had a woman in her 90s. They had all different walks of life, mm -hmm. all different kind of makeup. And Tom Savini, who did the makeup for this. He wanted to be involved and he wanted to play a part. But he didn't get a part, but he brought his makeup kit to the set. Mm. And that's all he needed to do. And for decades, he had a collaboration with George Romero. He did all of his movies. The car, and I, I gotta love the old cars, was owned by one of the producers, the actor producer, um, Russell mm -hmm. Steiner. Yeah. It was his mother's car. During filming, the car got banged. There's a little dent in, in the it. front, yeah. And this, it, the cemetery scene was shot over two days. They had to rethink how the car was going to travel. If you remember, the car is going down a kind of a hill and it hits a tree. Well, it hits a tree because they were shooting for that side. They had to rewrite side. a scene for the right. car. Right. Yeah. Because, and it's like, oh, that's clever. That little was little. really smart. And that's great because the one thing about this film that is great, mm -hmm. you get a lot of bang for the buck. Mm -hmm. Like you get a scare, then another scare, then another scare. And just his camera angles, the lighting, everything lends to all of this. Barbara, I'm sorry, the dumb blonde. You know, every horror film has to have a dumb blonde in it. Well, she Goes. wasn't dumb. She was in shock. Yeah, okay. So I, I'm thinking, you're going into, into a house. There's no one there. Like, do you really want to like... And the door's open. Yeah, but yeah. if a zombie's chasing you, and she didn't know he was a flesh eater at that point, you didn't know. He was just a crazy guy chasing her. Right. But, and back then, you think in 1968, you would run to a farmhouse. Not like now. We're afraid to go to somebody's That's house. People would leave their doors there. open back then. Yeah, we were all scared. We're scared now. But back then, I know I snuck into places. I was going all over the place. Mm -hmm. Now, forget it. You right. have a shotgun in your face. Right. And that scene when she walks in and meets Ben for the first time. Yeah. There's that shock because they're seeing each other for the first time. Again, you're seeing Ben. He's he's black. He's African American. She's white. Like, oh my God, is something bad going to happen? But immediately, as Ben's talking, you realize, no, he's the hero of this right. movie. He's the one that's going to take charge. That he, was clever too, Joe, because. They didn't want to repeat the story, but they wanted to tell you the story. Mm -hmm. And Ben told her, because she's comatose, she's mm -hmm. like, Ugh. Mm -hmm. he tells her what he found outside, that people are all over. He's giving the gist of the story to the audience. And then when she feels comfortable enough, knowing that's the alpha male to protect her, she tells about her brother, Johnny. But it was done so well that it wasn't redundant. It was just a great screenplay. It was very tight, you know? There are people downstairs in the basement. One of the great parts of the movie, I think, is portraying human nature. Yeah. Here you have a conflict, an older white gentleman. Everyone get in the basement. It's safer there. And Ben's like, no, you crazy? We're going to be trapped. These people are going to come in. We're going to be like rats in a cage. Right. And there's that conflict. And you're thinking, wait a minute, people. Figure out how you're going to get the hell out of there. 
instead of fighting over each other, and they're they're fighting, they're arguing. I mean, to the point where in some scenes there's actually violent responses between Ben and this particular gentleman. And you find out later, as the movie continues, that the daughter is downstairs. The daughter's probably what about ten years old, maybe yeah, maybe a little bit younger. She's yeah, she's sick. But she she's got sick. bit. She got bit. The young couple. The younger gentleman com comes upstairs. He's trying to be the peacemaker. Yeah, I'll go with Ben. Ben says, let's figure out how do we can get out of here. And then he's like trying to make peace with the other gentleman. He's like trying to be a peacekeeper. But he doesn't know what to do. And then his girlfriend comes out too. So it was like this huge mess, internal mess that they're trying. It's almost like being in an escape room nowadays. And they're boarding up the windows as best they can with what they can find. And that's Ben. He thinks, let's board up the windows. Let's get a hammer. Find some nails. Right. So he's a take charge guy where the other ones are just arguing and like, you know, mm -hmm. not doing really anything but causing more conflict. And they find their one piece of communication was the radio. There's this conflict between the husband and the wife. The wife is like, wait a minute, we should be upstairs. We need to know what's going on. And I was like, no, we need to be downstairs. So I'm like, people need to get your stuff together. Yeah, but I think if I was in that scene, I don't know, maybe I'd be like Barbara. I might be curled up in a fetal position on the couch. The scene where they go out to get the truck and they see the truck outside and they realize they're going to get in the house, these things. And it's juxtaposed with a gas pump mm -hmm. that's maybe 50 50 feet away. So the young guy, Tom, runs out and he says, I can get there. I can make it. I can drive it. I can do it. And he runs out. Ben is outside with a torch trying to keep the zombies away. His girlfriend, Tom's young girlfriend, runs out. She goes, I want to go with you. I want to go with you. So there's the running to the truck. That's a boop, a spike. Then she says she has to go. And Ben goes, well, get in the truck. She gets in the truck. Her jacket gets caught. Mm -hmm. They start pumping the gas. It runs a line and the torch lights the gas, which you know was going to run along the line to blow up the truck, which it does. And then the zombies go absolutely nuts, eating cannibal. There's intestines, there's brains, there's everything. And it's horrifying because black and white makes it worse. Mm -hmm. And there was like grandma, she's like 90 and she's eating intestines. And they used all this stuff like Bosco syrup for blood. Yes, chocolate syrup for they blood used on, on ham. Cooked ham. They used sausages. Mm -hmm. And it was like disgusting, but they used it and it looked real. Mm -hmm. And after that, everybody knew the zombies were cannibals. Right. Yep. Before that, they weren't sure. But right. then they knew. And Ben runs back to get in the house, and Harry won't let him in. And he's going, he's like, let me in, let me in, let me in, let me in. And mm -hmm. Harry's like, <gasps> and then he finally decides, well, I better do it. And he opens up, and I think Ben socks him, yeah. doesn't he? He wells yeah. on him, yep. Takes one shot, boom, he's done. And they never really said it, and I never thought about it back then. But they kind of gave an inkling that it was a detonated satellite from Venus because there was a Venus probe then, and they kind of used that, and they thought it was the radiation that made all the corpses come to life. Although George Romero, subsequent is in his mm -hmm. sequel done years He's never later, determined right, and then he made a statement, and it's in the when there's not enough room in hell, the dead shall roam the earth, or something like that. Okay, so he kind of twisted the belief that it was radiation, but it was actually something more Right. Well, I never demonic. thought about the radiation when it came out. I thought it may be radiation a little bit, but they never said anything in the TV. No. And I guess when I was researching that's, it. That's actually great because it keeps the audience member guessing what could it be. It creates conversations like what we're having now. It's like, what was it? And it creates these you know, very logical to very insane theories of what it could have possibly been. Two things, though, which are crazy, and this is my mother. My mother said this, and it was hysterical. Why doesn't the zombie eat Johnny in the graveyard? He knocks him down, hits his head on the thing, and instead he chases Barbara. He's a meal right there. Mm -hmm. It's like you got a turkey dinner right there. Where are you chasing the live thing you got to catch? Mm -hmm. And why didn't the farmer on the second floor, the wife, why didn't she come back to life? Don't know. Maybe they ate the brain. Maybe the brain was gone, but with Johnny, there was no excuse. Spoiler alert, get ready, folks. Ultimately, everyone in the house is either killed, eaten, dragged out. Um, they're, they're done. Ben is the only one left. Even the little girl, the daughter, she turns into a zombie and she kills her father and she kills her mother with a trowel. And just the sound was great on that trowel. 14 times. She's pounding away. And I, I, I mean, that was probably the most grotesque part of the movie. Yeah. Uh, matter of fact, I think in France, they 
edited it. I read somewhere where they edited it. It wasn't 14 slashes. It was only three because mm -hmm. it was just too gory. So Ben's the only one left. And he's in the rat cage, the place he never wanted to be. They said all along he shouldn't be. Law enforcement comes out. The news reels come out. Ben peeks out of the window. And the sheriff or the law enforcement captain says, there's one. And shoots him right in the head. And right he in the dies. head, dead. The hero dies. And I'm thinking. What a twist. Ma I was not expecting that. What a twist. The hunt, they used German Shepherds, and they were really straining at mm -hmm. the leash and going. And they also used grappling hooks to mm -hmm. grab the zombies and throw them in a heap and burn them, which was very redolent of Nazi Germany. Mm -hmm. And he put that in there. I don't yeah, even the know. Credits. Being... So it was interesting. You used yeah. like, these photographs and the movie. It wasn't Correct. just like Ben died, he got shot in the head. and The photographs, uh, the stills were great. Mm -hmm. And they continued with the sound effects going over. Mm -hmm. And at the end, you realize that Ben ends up in the heap next yeah, to you, Johnny. Yeah, getting hooked. It's yeah, so the black and the white John. are together. Right. But these big grappling hooks, which is like big meat hooks, hooks that you never saw again until Texas Chainsaw. Mm -hmm. Very Nazi. Very what happened with the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. So these are all really, really clever things that they can't even think of to do with modern horror film. Mm -hmm. And George Romero did it back in 1968. Mm -hmm. And that's why this thing has lasted like a crazy thing. called the zombie. The ingredients that go into a zombie include one and a half ounces of light rum, one and a half ounces of dark rum, one ounce of lime juice, one ounce of apricot brandy, one ounce of pineapple juice, one ounce of grenadine, a half ounce of simple syrup, but it's so sweet I didn't put the simple syrup. I don't think it's needed here. So now it's ruined for me because it's not sweet enough. A dash of bitters because of the movie, a horror movie. Yes. Or you could add a garnish on it like mint or a cherry or an orange slice and I added the little orange slice the little Polynesian umbrella. I love the, the umbrella drinks. So let's take a sip and see okay. how this, this is, came out. I'm Ooh. really going to take a sip. Mm. Woohoo! Very sweet. Very fruity. Well, I really, I like it and I'm going to drink it. But I'd like the simple syrup in it for me because I'm so sweet. Really? I'm That's so overkill. sweet that I like sweet drinks. Mm. But now, you know what I want to do? What? I want to sing, in the tiki 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 room, in the tiki 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 room, all the songbirds sing and the flowers bloom, in the tiki 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 room. Boop. I am dressed up as a zombie. Oh boy. A lot of the flesh eaters, because they didn't call them zombies in the movie. No. A little trivia there. No mention of zombies. Flesh eaters were walking around and going after the live meat, which were the humans. So I am dressed up as one of them. If you notice, there was a couple of them that must have gotten bitten or radiated or we don't know what. Yeah. Some of them well, were there was out an of idea so, for why the movie happened, but it was never explained. So I'm, I was, I'm, I'm a coming out of the bed flesh eater that got bitten. Or maybe I got a hickey or something like that. I don't know. One of these marks. And you're dressed me, up as? I have to explain this. Okay. Please explain. Yes, I'm trying like to. I know I look Albert like Einstein a punk on, uh, <laughs> I look on crack. Like Professor Irwin Corey from Superman. But actually, this is from Amazon, and this is a zombie wig. So this is what Amazon thinks a zombie looks like. Could have been a doctor, I have no idea, or a a cafeteria worker, <laughs> and I got bit as well, so I'm roaming the countryside. $30 million this film made. 30 million, 263 times its budget. The, the lead person in it is a black man, an African American, which was very, very rare because if you saw Winnie the Pooh, usually the African Americans in horror in the old days, they were murdered first. But she Dwayne took Jones. My line, by the way. Go well, ahead. you know, Dwayne Jones, who plays Ben, and he saw it. And why do you think they chose him? And what was the purpose? Because he was the best actor out of the group. So mm -hmm. you have to look at this as sort of an indie film. Well, not as of, it was an indie yeah. film. George Romero and company got together their friends and with Dwayne Jones, he was the best out of all of them as far as acting. He actually worked as a uh, English professor who directed the McGuire Theater at the old Westbury campus of New York State University. And he served as the, as the artistic director at the Richard Allen Center in New York City. So they didn't cast the part for a black person. They didn't write it for a black person. Matter of fact, they wrote it for a person who was crude. It was a truck driver, 
uh, kind of crass, but a hero. But when they looked around, like, wait, you're, you're the best one here. And so. he was very cultured and... Um, very intelligent, cultured, spoke well. If you watched the movie, you could tell he has an air about him. Of, he's very commanding. Mm -hmm. And he, he's like the type of guy you want with you. When zombies attack, he knew how to do everything, right. you know? So not only was he the uh, first black lead in a horror, but I also read where it was the first time in American cinema that a black actor was cast in a lead role of a major motion picture that did not specify that the part had to be played by a black actor. Right. So it's groundbreaking in the sense that it just, and now you're opening up doors. But it was almost like a happy mistake. It wasn't planned. Very much so, because if you remember 1968 in history, all the racial riots and, and the way there was so much animus in, in the, climb, the culture. So putting him in a position of authority and the lead of a film actually really worked for this picture because they saw it on so many levels how important it was. But if you, if you listen to interviews by George Romero, they weren't thinking that. Not at all. They no. were thinking, oh, you're just, you know, you're a great guy and you're, you know, a great actor and you're mm -hmm. the best out of the bunch of us. So yeah, you're, you're the lead. Right. And sometimes um, those mistakes make very significant pictures. Yeah. Judith O'Day plays Barbara. There wasn't too much about her because they were all kind of friends that were together. Keith Wayne, who played Tom, the young guy in it, tries to, he has his girlfriend with him and he tries to go for the truck with the gas. He committed suicide in 1995. I didn't see and that. And it was his only movie. That's all he ever did. George Romero. He has a great background. He formed a production company, which mm -hmm. people do like, an LLC or something. Where they, like Bold Media Films? Yes. Uh, all of his friends chipped in 10 grand a piece, and they actually got to $100,000 to produce this picture. Okay. Fact check. I didn't hear that. Well, I have it in my notes. No, I, I, I saw an interview where they said each person donated 600 to make it 6000 and then they did the film, almost like a short, and then they offered it to investors to invest, and they got the that rest of the money. Be. And that has happened with films like Sling Blade, maybe, I don't know. I didn't have that, uh, but that's all right, you know. We'll sounds, have to see who's right. You comment not, below, no, you let us know who's right. That sounds more feasible. Mm -hmm. That does, because this is where they were starting, and you figure the time, 1968. Oh, forget Like it. a coffee was five cents, and <sighs> breakfast special was nine dollars, uh -huh. and you know, so you're probably right. And he continued to make Dawn of the Dead, which topped the original as money. But he wasn't a good businessman. No. Distributors took most of the profits from him, unbelievably. Here we go again with these and, horror and movies. And do you know why? The company screwed up the copyright. And why? So the film went into public domain, so he never profited from any and video why? sales. So initially the, the movie was named, uh, titled um, Flesh Eaters. Okay. And the distribution company was were concerned because there was a movie that was very similar in title. So they changed it to The Night of the Living Dead. Well, when they changed the title, they literally edited it. They forgot to throw the copyright statement on it, which made it available for public domain How sad. pretty much immediately How sad. and allow people to earn bucks off of something they never made. Right. So that's why when our producers always like put on each episode, copyright statement, blah, 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 blah. Now you know be why. Careful. George Romero, he was, he was more into making commercials, but he also filmed for Mr. Rogers. Did you know that? I did know that. And yes. I thought it was so cute. He, he did an episode that he remembers Mr. Rogers gets a tonsillectomy. And he was in charge of going off-site, not in the house, uh -huh. but going to different sites. And in this case, Mr. Rogers was getting his tonsillectomy. He asked him after the film was done, like, hey, what do you think? Now, remember, Mr. Rogers was a minister. George said in the interview that uh, he, was, he was okay with it. He was surprised. He goes, well, you did a... He did the job he wanted to do, like, yeah. not like praising it, but not. I never heard anything bad about never Fred Rogers. Bad. No, I never, never saw the movie I think Tom Hanks made mm -hmm. with him, but I, I would never heard anything bad about him. And one of his inspirations for this, Romero, his inspiration for Night of the Living Dead is one of my top five horror films ever, Carnival of Souls, which I absolutely loved. And it's, you got to see it. It's on TV a lot too, but don't, do not watch the new colorized version because just like they did with Psycho, they remade it and they did shot, I think Gus Van Zandt did Psycho, I'm not sure, but they did shot for shot, but they colorized it and it was just, you know, it, it was just, didn't have the soul of the original. They filmed it in black and white, not so much because they wanted it in black and white, but they couldn't afford color. 
But again, right. another happy mistake. Yeah. It wouldn't have worked. Right. In color. Matter of fact, many years later, they did a, a remake mm -hmm. in color and it wasn't as, as successful. They didn't do a disclaimer. I mean, you know, you're watching it and mostly drive in. This was a drive in yes. picture. Mm -hmm. But they used Pennsylvania, a remote section of Pennsylvania, and they used all the towns around it with the real names. Mm -hmm. And they actually had TV footage of a TV announcer saying, Oh, they you know well, they don't know why this happened, but get to your shelter and hear the name for the shelter. And the guy on the TV reporting was actually a TV reporter mm -hmm. that they used. Well, I think that's what makes a movie not only great but a classic if a group of people can identify with it. Yes, and then and they all like a certain it. part. Yeah. Right, it's almost like Rocky Horror, mm -hmm. Rocky Horror Picture Show, where the movie sucked when it yeah. came out, but the occult following and now there's a whole you know, every... You don't know what's going to click with right. the American public. That's for damn sure. And this was this was one of them. This created yeah. a whole new opening for, for horror movies. Yeah. They never used the word zombie. Flesh Eaters was used. Because in George's opinion... Yes. Zombies were of a sort from an, the islands. Like you put a voodoo... Right. ...whammy on someone and Correct. they zombified. And they weren't, well, they weren't scary, flesh really. They just walked around crazy, you know? And then he was also competing with um, Richard Matheson's novel, I Am a Legend. There were similarities in the eating of other humans, mm -hmm. but he always he had this kind of a fairly good relationship with, with Richard Matheson that he, he called them flesh eaters. He even called them ghouls, but not zombies. And in I Am a Legend, they were vampires, not flesh eaters. Right. So yeah. I don't know if he was just trying to avoid any copyright issues, but... I think but I might have seen The Flesh Eaters, too. I've and never seen And it was about that. the islands, and it's very... It's not... It's something to watch if you love to really delve into cinema, but it's not something that you're going to be really titillated by. Mm -hmm. Which of the following was an alternate ending considered by George Romero originally for The Night of the Living Dead? Four choices. Okay. One is true. Ben survives the night, but all other survivors are zombified, forcing him to kill them and lose his sanity. B. Ben and Barbara escape together, finding refuge in a military bunker. C. The farmhouse is destroyed by a bomb, killing both the zombies and the survivors. D. Ben turns into a zombie and joins the horde at the end. What was A again? Or it one? was Ben survives the night, but all other survivors are zombified, forcing him to kill them and lose his sanity. I like that one. You're right. Oh. Yes. I like that. This idea was scrapped know, in favor of the, of the existing tragic ending, but it shows how Romero toyed with even more grim outcomes. And Dwayne Jones, Jones thank you, for a hard time today, said, I love his statement. In an interview, he said, I convinced George that the black community would rather see me dead than saved. After all, that has gone on in a corny and symbolically confusing way. The heroes never die in American movies. The jolt of that and the double jolt of the hero being black seem like a double-barreled whammy. Children Shouldn't Play With Dead Things from 1972. Known as a horror comedy, it's a very rare film. Six friends in a theatrical troupe dig up a corpse on an abandoned island to use in a mock satanic ritual. One of my top... 10 horrors of all time, Carnival of Souls, 1962. You always refer to that movie, Deb. I love this movie. After a traumatic accident, Mary, a church organist, becomes drawn to a mysterious abandoned carnival, which is the Salt Air Pavilion in Magna, Utah. Now look up Salt Air, S-A-L-T-A-I-R in Utah. It's still standing. It was in the gilded era what Utah had for a shore type of escape in the Great Salt Lake, fascinating. And Carnival of Souls, you got to watch it. It's incredible. George Romero, Dawn of the Dead from 2004. Escalating zombie apocalypse, two Philadelphia SWAT team members, a traffic reporter, and his TV executive girlfriend seek refuge in a secluded shopping mall. It was definitely a consumer shopping statement from George Romero about shoppers wandering aimlessly to buy things on the weekend. White Zombie, 1932. We've gone back to Bella 
Lugosi again playing Murder Legendre. A young man turns to a witch doctor to lure the woman he loves away from her fiance, but instead he turns her into a zombie slave and they use the Dracula Castle set again. So when you watch it, you will see the whole Dracula set. Shaun of the Dead from 2004, a buddy comedy and parody of the zombie genre. British comedian Simon Pegg stars as Sean, an aimless electronic salesman who lives in London, along with his roommate Ed, a feckless layabout. Their pub-swilling, uneventful life is disrupted by a horde of zombie attacking the area. So that's my watch list, Joe. Excellent watch list, Thank you Debbie. very much for Can't the wait. praise. Ooh, did you ever see the movie... Zombieland? Yes. Woody Harrelson? Yes. So you've created now a whole new genre of zombies. Whether George named it or not, he didn't, but everyone's calling them zombies. And whether they're B-rated or top-rated movies, TV shows, um, people dress up as zombies. So in this case, when I saw the premiere of Zombieland in what New York is? City, they got people before the movie to go to a particular location on Times Square, get zombified and walk through Times Square cool. to go into the premiere of that movie. So it's kind of, it's kind of neat, but you never hear about like what else out there. Well, look at Walking Dead way. for mm -hmm. God's sakes. Look at how that went. And that was the biggest premiere on AMC ever. Any drawbacks of the movie? No, that could have no, been? I think it's, uh, it's a 10. Did you think it was a little slow? Not at I all. Was, I was feeling a little no. slow. Not one bit. You're watching it at home on your couch mm -hmm. with your with Jasper running all around and everything. <laughs> no, if you saw this. Jasper's my dog, folks. Yeah. <laughs> it's not a person. <laughs> it's, not, it's not a person running around, a little kid. But no, if you saw this when you were 15 years old in a drive-in, this movie was beyond. I mean, this was like seeing The Exorcist, which people just could not, it, it was tremendous. Jaws, these are traumatic films that change things, and a whole collective consciousness in America was terrified by this thing. That's why I give this a strong 10. And as the sun sets at the art factory in Patterson, New Jersey, I don't know, Deb, where are we going to go next? Joe, I can only tell you what I've told you once and I've told you a thousand times. We never know where we're going until we go there.